I want to thank Squarespace for helping make this video possible. Head on over to squarespace.com polyphonic to get 10% off your first purchase. There are few sounds in all of music more iconic than a distorted guitar. From Chuck Berry's opening lick on Johnny B. Good, through Jimmy Page's electric black dog or Angus Young's thunderous back in black, all the way to Jack White's crunchy fell in love with the girl, distortion is synonymous with rock and roll. In fact, when many people think of the electric guitar, the sound that comes into their head is distortion, rather than the instrument clean. It's really not a stretch to say that distortion helped make music what it is today. But what exactly is distortion, and where did it come from? Let's take a closer look. Distortion can really describe a number of different processes, but all of them are achieving the same outcome, manipulating an instrument's waveform to change the sound. Any kind of amplification device has a limit to the length of sound waves it can put out. When you start to push past that limit, the device will compress the edges of the sound waves, which messes with the sound. In a lot of recording, distortion is actually something to be avoided. For example, if I crank up my voice over like this, it distorts and makes me rather unpleasant to listen to. However, it turns out that exact process sounds pretty cool when you do it to a guitar. Guitars first started to figure this out in the 1940s. Back then, they used vacuum tube amplifiers. These vacuum tubes could only take so much electricity going through them. Guitarists discovered that if you cranked the volume on your amp, the power flowing through it would push it into overdrive, and the vacuum tubes would compress the sound waves so that they wouldn't break. The result was shifting a smooth, clean guitar sound into something with more grit and growl. This kind of distortion is aptly named Overdrive, and it quickly became the rage in the late 1940s and early 1950s. We don't really know who the first to do it is, but we do know that one of the early pioneers of this distortion was named Junior Bernard. Bernard was the lead guitarist for Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys. He was an aggressive player who was always trying to push his sound into something grittier and earthier to reflect the country blues he played. For a perfect example of this distortion, check out Bernard Blues. Dirty. Oh, killing me. Guitarists all over heard Bernard's sound and latched on, experimenting with distortion on their own. One of these was Gory Carter, who filled his track Rock A While with intense fuzz. Feeling good this morning, I feel like I wanna rock a while. Another artist that dabbled in distortion was Howlin' Wolf. For example, just check out the fuzzy lick on 1951's How Many More Years. Earlier in 1951, Jackie Brenston and his Delta Cats had released Rocket 88, a song that some qualify as the first rock and roll recording. That song featured Willie Kazart ripping a wicked distorted guitar riff, though legend has it his distortion came by accident. There's conflicting stories as to how, but everyone seems to agree on the basic facts. Kizart's amp got damaged while the band was on the road. To try to fix it, he stuffed balls of newspaper into it, hoping to hold the speaker cone in. And the result was unintentional distortion. But producer Sam Phillips loved the sound, and so he leaned into it. <laughs> This started a trend that would continue through the 1950s, guitarists sabotaging their amplifiers to create their own distortion. One of these was Link Ray, who stabbed his amp's speaker cone with a pencil to give it a heavy, gritty sound. You can hear that in a track like Rumble, which was so intense for the time that it got banned from airplay because people thought it would incite gang fights.
This was a bad time to be a speaker cone. In 1964, Dave Davies took a razor and ambushed his cone to create the guitar sound of You Really Got Me. <laughs> By this time, musicians had realized what distortion was capable of, and people started to look for new ways to do it without destroying their amps. That's where the fuzz box comes in. In 1961, Marty Robbins bassist Grady Martin played through a mixing board with a faulty connection. The result was a sludgy, heavy bass solo that cut through a warm country song. Me. Recording engineer Glenn T. Snotty took this sound and reverse engineered it. By figuring out where the circuit was faulty, he was able to create a small box that could recreate the sound, the fuzz box. In addition to letting musicians play the sound without annihilating their equipment, it also allowed guitarists to turn distortion on and off with the stomp of a foot. In its early days, fuzzbox sales were lukewarm, but then a guitarist by the name of Keith Richards decided to try one out and tore out one of the greatest riffs of all time, Satisfaction. This riff single-handedly vaulted the fuzz box into common usage, and soon enough, imitators were coming and creating their own take on the equipment. One of the first to do so was Ivor Arbiter, who created the Arbiter Fuzz Face. A young man named Jimi Hendrix picked up one of these and used it on his band's debut album. When Are You Experience opened with the manic, psychedelic distortion of Purple Haze, there was no turning back. Thanks to his guitar tech, Roger Mayer, Hendrix would continue to innovate with distortion, playing around with new combinations of amps and fuzz boxes to push distortion like none before him. And following Hendrix, we would see countless innovators in distortion. Throughout the 70s and 80s, it was a race to see who could push music into the grittiest, loudest territory, and distortion became essential to the growing genres of hard rock, metal, and punk. Today, it's not uncommon to see guitarists like John Frusciante or The Edge layer all kinds of different post-processing and distortion to create that perfect sound. Distortion is the lifeblood of rock and roll. It helped birth the genre, and then it allowed it to explode in popularity and change music forever. And it all happened because of a few lucky accidents. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Head on over to squarespace.com slash polyphonic to start your free trial and use the offer code polyphonic to get 10% off your first purchase. If you want to make a website for your band, blog, business, or really anything else in your life, Squarespace is the place for you. It's an all-in-one platform where you can use designer templates to build your own website. They've got award-winning 24-7 customer service and a really user-friendly interface. I'm a big fan of Squarespace and I just used their platform to build a new website where I'll be hosting all kinds of playlists. It's going to be a great resource for viewers who wonder what song I played or want to get more into the topics that I touch on. I don't have a ton of background in web design and honestly, it was really seamless and easy to make a slick looking website. It was all drag and drop and it was really intuitive to integrate the playlists right into the website. So head on over to squarespace.com slash polyphonic to start your free trial today. And remember, use the offer code polyphonic to show them that I sent you and you'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain.